Okay, thank you everybody for joining us on this uh, pre-Rosh Hashanah, pre-Yom Kippur, pre-Sukkot uh, Family Connections meeting for alumni and for other people from the public who've decided to come to this one. What are we doing tonight? We're discussing Chagay Tishrei. We're discussing the fact that the holidays are coming and providing you with DBT strategies and tips for surviving and thriving. Who are we? The National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder of Israel. Uh, my name is Mishulam Gottlieb. I'm one of the co-founders of the organization. For those who might not know, this is our logo. And here we have our website, www.neabpd.co.il. And there is uh, my name and our phone number and office uh, email where you can reach us if you have any further questions, ideas, and so on and so forth. Why are our loved ones so upset in Tishrei? Why? I mean, it's a nice hall, it's a nice month. Why should they be so upset? Well, here we he, here we see a little bit of what's going on in their heads right now, and in some of our heads also. The leaves are whirling around and around and around, and you can think of a red leaf as sadness or anger, better, and a yellow leaf as sadness, and a green leaf as uh, overexcitement, and uh, the grass as another emotion that's going on. Basically, our loved ones are upset or emotionally dysregulated, to use the technical term, because there's so much going on, or as Nahama said uh, before, um, the, the, uh, there's Hamun Biyachad, there's a lot of people, and a lot of time spent together, and a lot of formal meals, and this means a lot of emotional dysregulation, a lot of fear of judgment, a lot of just difficulty being with people and controlling all these swelter of emotions. And that to me is symbolized maybe by the fall and by all these uh, leaves that are swirling around. In the month of Tishrei, as opposed to let's say other holidays that come up, there are intrinsic issues, I think, which really get on people's nerves. There's the new year and the days of atone, a judgment, self-judgment and atonement. And between the new year, between this notion of something's beginning, so we got to check what we did last year, and we've got to sort of plan for next year and figure out what's the right thing to do, and the sense of judgment that, that clouds everything, right? The sense of judgment that I'm judging myself and scrutinizing what I did last year, I'm scrutinizing what I'm doing this year or next year. And God, the Almighty, is scrutinizing me and judging me. Uh, so, you know, whether you're religious or not, this is a period of the year where there's a lot of thought going into what have I done? What will I do? Is that okay? Is that not okay? And that, as we all know, uh, is a big, big, enormous trigger for uh, people who have borderline personality disorder. Uh, the self-judgment, once it begins, can get out of hand. We all know, again, that scrutinizing the last year is not a bad thing. Checking out the facts of what happened is not a bad thing. But it's a danger for our loved ones because oftentimes that becomes very quickly a trip down memory lane, which is very self-judgmental, very invalidating. And that, leaves, that leads them to being in that welter of emotions and, you know, God forbid, also entering into maladaptive behaviors. This poster here says it all sort of, achot ktana tfilotea orcha veona tehilotea el na refa na lamakalotea may God um, yeah, cure of her ailments tichle shana vechilotea may the year and its curses right end tichel shana ubirchotea May we have a, a coming good year, a blessing. And uh, that, that's a lot of pressure for all of us to be under, to be under a year of scrutinizing the bad. And Dafka, we're thinking about, you know, what didn't go right, and then moving on to a new year. So it's no surprise that in that environment where you even hear it on the radio and in the street, you know, uh, on your uh, sh shopping uh, receipts, it says, you know, Shana Tova or whatever, it's, 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 it's stressful. 
Now, there are a host of stumbling blocks, uh, which are not particularly dealing with this chag, right? You have the invalidating environment, which the home turns into, right? There's all the holiday preparations going on, cooking, cleaning, building the sukkah. And that just turns the home into a pressure cooker because you have all this going on. You need to take care of it. There are deadlines, deadlines for Shana, deadlines for Yom Kippur, deadlines for Sukkot. And uh, there's a lot of usually screaming and yelling and help, please, and so on and so forth. And during this period where there's this tension in the house, we're also so caught up in Yom Tif preparations that we're oblivious to, or as Valerie reminded me of, yes, they are unmindful of our loved ones and their pain. We're ignoring them. And that, of course, is very invalidating for them. The 25-hour fast puts pressure of its own on family members and loved ones alike, right? I mean, I know, you know, if, if there's disordered eating in the house, which is yeah, pretty common, actually, these days, uh, but even if there isn't disordered eating, the idea of not eating for 25 hours is somewhat stressful. And there's a lot of, you know, make sure we have enough time to eat before the Chag begins. And then, you know, what are we eating after the Chag? And again, more and more pressure. And since it's around food, it can also be particularly stressful for someone who has some kind of disordered eating, which is comorbid with, uh, with uh, borderline. There's a fear of abandonment, which gets triggered. Do my family and the rabbis care more about the holidays than about my pain and me? Good question. Well, I guess it depends what the family and the rabbis do, but there's certainly a potential fear of this abandonment. There's a lack of validation, right? You will ask, oh, could you just help me cook or set the table? You know, it's no big deal, right? And are people with learned experience, sorry, lived experience, PWLEs, people with lived experience, they find that very invalidating because you don't know how hard it is for me to set the table, right? You don't know how hard it is for me right now to take part in the cooking when there's three people in the kitchen and everyone's arguing with each other, who has the spoon and where's the sugar? This is, I can't be here. And it's invalidating of you not to notice that. There's the overwhelm caused by the multitude of people and lengthy joint uh, activities, which Nechama uh, said, mentioned, too much together time. And it's important to note that, you know, any introvert worth his or her salt will not like the multitude of people and lengthy joint activities, or it certainly won't be first nature. Um, so it's not abnormal to find it difficult. However, obviously for our loved ones, the emotional overwhelm is far greater. There's self-judgment over the failure to perform up to holiday expectations. You know, everybody expects you to put, let's say, if you have borderline and you're the, the mother of the house, you know, everyone expects you to, to set the table beautifully and to have the perfect feast and so on and so forth. And you just can't do it, right? Or, or like um, Devorah mentioned, right? Uh, Sanda, you know, she's not in a place where she can even remember to, to, to order Rosh Hashanah food now. So people with uh, borderline sometimes are unable to perform with expectations, probably never able to, to live up to their own expectations because they're very self-judgmental. And uh, therefore that creates a lot of, you know, emotional tailspin. And finally, an interesting point, even if there's a head tear, a dispensation to eat on Yom Kippur, which you would think of to be very validating, right? Okay, you have an eating disorder, let's say, and it's, you know, trigger, it, it could be triggered, and the Rabbanim are going to be very clear that you have to eat like normal. No question, you have, you have to. So on the one hand, that's validating. And on the other hand, wow, I'm not even, you're not even telling me I have to keep the mitzvah? What am I, some kind of an alien or something like that? I feel ostracized from the, from the community. So even something like the rabbi is sort of showing caring, as it were, can, can make uh, you know, a PWLE feel ostracized. I'm not saying that, that people with borderline personality disorder necessarily get a head tear for, uh, for, not eating, on your, for eating on Yom Kippur, but certainly uh, when we're talking about someone with, uh, with um, uh, eating disorders, that's uh, clear. Although, of course, you should ask a rabbi like Rabbi uh, Yoni Rosenzweig or read his book. Okay. So what happens? You have all these triggers going on, all of Tishrei, 
things are just, you know, upside down in the house. There's so much tension. There's a sense of being abandoned. There's a sense of being uh, not cared for. There's a sense of, uh, you know, being invalidated. Comes the night and the worst thing that any family member can hear is, no, I'm not coming. Oh my God, I've prepared, I've set up, I've done everything. We did cope with what, you're not coming? This can't be, you know, we'll be embarrassed. We'll be, you know, it ruins everything. And it happens. It happens because by this time the pot just boils over. And you'll hear things like, I refuse to dress up for the holiday. It's just too much. I can't figure out what dress to wear. Or I'm not coming down to dinner. Everyone will judge me and everyone hates me anyway. Or my favorite one from BPD spouses, your family has always hated me. Why should I go to their place? Or go without me. I'll be fine at home alone. And that sounds like a possible compromise. But what about if your loved one at this point is engaging in suicidality, suicidal ideation, or active suicidality? The words go without me, I will be fine at home alone. Send a chill through your bones. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay with them? Probably, right? Is staying with them invalidating? Perhaps, right? So you're in a very, very difficult situation right now. Uh, so it could be, you know, go without me. Or it could be I'll stay up in my bedroom, which may also scare you, right? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of emotions that, trans, that are transferred onto the family members uh, when these things are said. And the person may be depressed now. Your loved one may be depressed. They could make suicide threats. If you go, well, you know, kill myself. Or if you go to, if you make me go to her house, I, you know, there are threats and there's even active suicidality uh, could be in the picture. So the family members are in distress after all that's gone on over the last month with all the pressure of getting things ready. Uh, and, you know, getting no help, doubtless, uh, from too many people who should be helping. Uh, there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of fatigue. And we're very vulnerable when we finally got into this evening and we really wanted to go well. And then suddenly the pot boils over. And uh, this is, I guess, a picture of the pot boiling over uh, or certainly all this emotions going on. And here we are, the family members just standing there and not knowing what to do. And indeed, I would even add, not knowing what to do as individuals and being broken up into individuals by what's going on, right, in many cases. We're not acting as a united front, even, in the face of what's going on. Okay, so how do we feel? Anger and frustration at the PWLE, right? Frustration is where we thought this could work, and now it's not. You know, we thought that we got into the day and it looked like it would, it would pan out, and it's not. There could be shame if we, have other, if we have guests over who don't really know the situation and we feel ashamed in front of them with what's going on, even with just the person saying, I'm not coming down to dinner. Well, how, how are you going to explain that? There could be disappointment. I mean, there obviously is disappointment. I worked so hard. I finally got everything ready. I thought it was going to go, and now I'm really disappointed. There may be a sense of guilt. I didn't do enough. I didn't pay attention enough. Maybe if I would have, then things would be different. There'll doubtless be sadness that this is not the Yom Tov table that you expected to have. This is not what you were hoping for. And there could be fear, fear of suicidality, uh, fear of, uh, you know, of, of embarrassment. So here we are with the family member, the, sorry, the loved one, being full of emotions and boiling over. And we're also full of emotions. And whether we boil over or not, we're certainly stewing with all of these emotions going on. So the first tip I would give you is open your mind and deal with your own feelings before you open your mouth and talk with your loved one. Right? If you just come off the cuff, unless you've really been steeped in DBT and you're brilliant at it, maybe you're like an Alan Frusetti type uh, from birth, then fine, no problem, just shoot from the hip. But anybody else, take some time to think about it. You know, that time could be a half a minute, a minute, whatever the case may be, but take some time to check in with yourself 
check in with your own feelings, check in if you're in control of them before you make any decisions about how you want to act. All right, so is it effective to ask the PWLE to just try a little harder to remind him or her that you have worked so hard to put this evening together? I hope behind your muted selves, uh, you're laughing because obviously this is not something that's probably going to be very effective. To try a little harder, they try everything. They've used all their skills. They're just beyond it right now. And to remind them of your work that you put in, this is just not the time for that. There may be a time for that, but this isn't the time for that because they can't hear it. All they can do now is think about themselves and their own fear and their own panic and their own overwhelm. So don't forget our loved one's pain. I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen this slide before. And Marshall Linehan says, borderline individuals are the psychological equivalent of third degree burn patients. They're individuals, uh, they simply have, so to speak, no emotional skin. Even the slightest touch or movement or trigger can create immense suffering. And that's, that, that's, that's BPD in a nutshell, this extreme emotional dysregulation, this extreme reactivity, the inability to go back to baseline to a point where their minds are so filled with so many emotions that all that can come out really is this scream that we see of munches on the um, on the screen and behind is standing the family members and, and they are just stock still because what can you do this person is just in overwhelm emotional distress they can't handle it and and what are you going to do so the next slide is actually going to answer that question in general it may help to start by practicing radical acceptance and this is during that minute before you respond and all of you having gone through family connections, or at least most of you, will know what radical acceptance is. But in the spirit of uh, um, refresh, sorry, review, refresh, and remind ourselves, let's do it again, right? How do we radically accept? You stop denying reality and just fully accept it. For instance, yesterday in the class, one of the uh, participants said, it really is unpleasant to be at our family Yom Tov table. I said, wow, that's fantastic. And then I had to apologize because it's not really fantastic, but it's really fantastic that she was able to state that. It's really unpleasant to be at our family Yom Tov table. And this is not what I expected. And it's not what I wanted, right? But it is the reality. And recognizing that reality is a very, is a very powerful way to begin to change it. So recognizing it, and saying this is not what we had hoped for, nor do we like the situation, but it is what it is. It's just that it, it is what it is. We do not have to like our reality, nor do we have to resign ourselves to it, never change it. But we do need to accept that right now, this is the reality, and there is nothing we can do to change it. That really is our loved one. They are really an extremist, and they are really, you know, sitting in the middle of our, our, of our, of our, of our Yontif meal uh, in an undershirt and their underwear uh, and, and complaining about why the food isn't you know, hot or something like that. It, this is what is happening. And we can't really do anything contingent. So we have to accept first that it's the reality. And of course, if we can change it, there's no reason not to carefully do so. Right? But uh, radical acceptance, as you may all remember, is in a situation where you really can't solve it. Uh, right now, and it's making you miserable, at least accept that it is what it is first. And usually, oftentimes, after accepting reality, change is possible. Uh, thank you to Carl Rogers for pointing that out. Um, sometimes we need to grieve what we have lost before we can move on or accept, right? So in that little minute, you may need to quickly grieve and, and radically accept or radically accept and quickly grieve, whichever which at least uh, will put you on a more even keel emotionally to not be fighting the reality uh, and not be grieving it. And again, if you do this work beforehand, it's much more effective, right? If you take the time before you to, to make one of the things you have to do, practice radical acceptance of, you can't really radically accept what hasn't happened yet um, because it hasn't happened yet. But the, the, you know, uh, in, insofar as we could give it a shot, it's helpful. 
to uh, to think of what might happen and to the degree it's possible to, to accept it and grieve it, even though it hasn't happened yet. So what are we gonna do when, uh, when this happens at the, the dining room table? So there's problem resolution and management, as you may remember from the classes, I don't know if, if, uh, if you, Valerie or uh, Mish mentioned it, but the Gottman uh, Family Institute talks about the fact that in 69% of the uh, disagreements, I think it's 69% of the disagreements, um, a husband and wife are not gonna find a solution because they, 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 they are in disagreement because this is just their natures. One's an extrovert, one's an introvert. You're not going to change that. You can shape that, but you're not going to change it. So you can't resolve the situation. What you can do is manage it. What you can do is say, okay, you're an introvert. I'm an extrovert. And we'll go out, you know, once a month. Uh, or we'll go out only to, you know, dark restaurants and not bright restaurants where there's lots of people all over. Whatever the case may be, you may be able to manage the situation and hopefully you will be able to. But, uh, but you may not be able to resolve it in most cases. So what are we going to do about our, our management of the problem? So there's management before, steps we can take before, management in the midst of the crises, and management after the crisis. So if we can create a more potential, a more validating environment during LO, that would be great, right? Identify the emotions that are going on in the house, reflect them back to people so they know what they are, or if they talk about them, reflect it back so they know that you understand them. Validate, validate, validate. Also set whatever necessary limitations there might be on people's behavior. You know, you can't just sit and watch, uh, you know, I don't know, play on your phone for two days while I slave in the kitchen. Uh, okay, if that's, if that's your limitation. So you need to, uh, you need to bring that up. Love that kind with the, with the person who uh, has borderline personality disorder with anybody who's, uh, who's, uh, who's uh, crossing your red lines. Assuming it'll be effective, of course. Okay, so that's LO. Try to have a better LO. And then you'll be in a place when, the, when, when Tishrei hits to have a, a, a solid basis for trying to cope. Number two, during LO, no potential triggers and plan cope ahead to deal with the crises these will engender. And preferably do this in a collaborative fashion. Sit down with your loved one and talk to them about how they're gonna feel when there's all those people there. Talk to them about uh, how they feel about uh, thinking about how was last year and how is next year gonna be. Talk to them about what does it mean to judge, you know? I mean, the more you can work together, identify problems and then brainstorm and collaborate to create cope aheads, the better. Because as you all know, I hope, I'll remember more to the point, right? Cope aheads, help us relax because we know if it happens, we'll just pull it out of the drawer. And it's also very helpful to write down cope heads that have been collaboratively agreed on so that when the crisis strikes, you just pull it out. Page 62, this is what we're going to do. Theoretically, that's what governments are supposed to do, right? When there's a nuclear crisis, this is what we have to do. We know everything. Uh, and that makes us calm down because we don't. We're in good hands. We have, we have a plan. And when trouble hits, we have a plan. Okay. During the crisis itself, if you haven't coped ahead and your relationship is uh, not in good shape now after this very difficult month, you will try and validate and empathize in order to reduce emotions. emotions. Um, family members should use distress tolerance, self-compassion and validation and self-soothe self -soothe tools. This is during that minute that I've given you, or maybe it could be five minutes. If the person's up in their room, take a half an hour, right? It doesn't have to be a very fast process. And again, this can also be thought of beforehand, right? What kind of distress tolerance tools might be useful? Uh, how do you do uh, self-compassion? Let's practice it a few times before. What's uh, the self-soothe to soothe tools, right? You can put yourself in a situation where you'll be able to be more effective at calming yourself down at that time. Maybe. Okay. And obviously, effectively encourage the PWLE to use whatever tools they have at their disposal 
obviously effectively is a big word there, right? If it's going to make them explode, if you mention their DBT skills, that's not a great idea. But if you can effectively encourage them, or even if they've gone to another room and you sit with them and you work with them um, to use whatever tools they have, that can be also effective. And after that we've done before in the midst and after the crisis, search for a collaborative way to resolve or manage the problem after emotions have reduced, right? When you can actually talk to them, or at least partially talk to them, just go in there and validate and then ask your loved one to offer alternative solutions to the problem, right? There's, they're, they're, they, they, can, they can come up with things, right? So try to brainstorm with them. Turn your loved one into an active participant in finding a solution or a compromise. Um, and again, all of these things, if you do them beforehand, that's you know hopefully going to make things work better in in the moment. You can you know discuss it, uh, create cope heads. But even if you haven't, you have skills in the moment that you could use and and work with, and uh, you know and, and collaborate on. Uh, together to try to find solutions. And, you know, thinking about what uh, Yael said, if her daughter happens to show up, what do I do? Okay, well, let's not wait till then to figure out what you're going to do. Let's decide now what you're going to do if she doesn't come. Are you going to phone her? Are you going to send a little gift? Are you going to WhatsApp her, right? What, what are you going to do to validate her if she doesn't come? Maybe you know, we could send a book so that she has a piece of you there with her during this, this time alone away from the family. I don't know. There's a lot of things that could be thought of. And at the same time, uh, if she does come, what are you going to do, right? How can you uh, engage her in a way that's likely? What tools can you use sorry, in a way that's likely not to trigger her? And of course, um, I think very importantly, and we oftentimes don't think about this, is that the other family members are also part of the part of the um, the dynamic, and you can really sit down with your other family members a week before and say, "Look, you know, so and so is going to be at the Rosh Hashanah with us. Maybe she doesn't live at home, or he doesn't live at home. You know, she's going to be there, and you know, let's talk. You know, how do you feel about that? What are you worried about?" Uh, what do you think you know we can do about that and if you really work together then it becomes you know it instead of being oh she's coming home so we have to do everything for her it becomes we're a family we want to work together we want to try and create the best yontif meal that we can and if we understand each other's you know issues and and how we react to them then we'll be able to do that much better. If one child says, toss her out of the house, and another child says, no, she has to be here, I love her, you know, that's going to be complicated. But if you discuss that beforehand, it's very powerful for your other family members to be empowered and part of the solution. And it also empowers them just to know that you care about how they feel. It's not just, you know, she's coming, I don't care what you think, this is how it goes. Uh, so I would urge you also to do that. Uh, you know, to have a little family powwow before and to really, in that sense, open up the wounds <laughs> if you have the koya to do that and if other people are willing to do that so that, you know, so that the whole dynamic can be uh, at least on the table, if you will, uh, no pun intended, and not just, you know, underneath the table creating all kinds of problems. Okay, so I'm going to pause the taping right now.